One man declares war on an entire nation. And then we take a look at... It's my movie trailer voice. And then we take a look at the mysterious disappearance of five men on a dark, snowy night. They're known as the Yuba County Five, but it's also known as the American Dyatlov Pass, today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day, too. Merch store is up. If you want to support the channel, you can wear our merch around town. We'll buy it first, but after you buy it, wear it around town. Everyone will go, hey, where'd you get that cool shirt? And you go, I got it from a merch store online. And they go, which one? And you're like, uh, I don't know. Just go to deadrabbit.com and listen to the podcast and then buy a shirt if you like it. And they'll be like, cool. So we got a lot of good stuff for you this week. I've actually found a lot of stories about badasses. I didn't find five, and I know there's hundreds, but it's what I can find in the time allotted. But I found some good ones. I, I was thinking I could do Badass Week. And then I was like, nah, I might be pushing it. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a journey back in time. And it's funny because I'm going to tell you the story and you're like, whoa, that's a cool setup for a movie. And it is, but there's some problems to why they won't make a movie about it. We're going back in time. we got to blend in with the population. So we're going to bring the Jason Jalopy. <laughs> but we... Put some paper mache horses on it so people think that, you know, like it's just a carriage. Because we're actually going back to the beginnings of the Civil War. We're going to Tennessee. And specifically, we're going there to meet a man. His name is Jack Henson. Now, Jack Henson was a southerner. He had slaves. So that's one reason why they don't want to make the movie. He has slaves. He has a family. But he wants to remain neutral in the Civil War. He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get involved in this in any way, shape, or form. But it's raging around him. So, he's completely, like, neutral. This His little farmland, well, it wasn't little, it was a plantation full of slaves. He he was neutral. He's like, I'm not going to support either side. I don't want anything to do with Civil War. I'm an honest man with a bunch of slaves. I don't want to get involved. Now, eventually, Union troops did take over his area. And people are like, we got to fight back. We got to be like this guerrilla force. And Jack's like, nope, we're not going to do it. We're businessmen. Okay, we got families. We're not going to get involved in this war in any way, shape, or form. And you shouldn't either. The war is between generals and these big powers. We're just landowners with slaves. And everyone's like, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. Someone goes, what if we lose? He's like, well, we'll deal with that later. But we don't need to get involved in the bloodshed. Ulysses S. Grant actually came to the area. General Ulysses Grant at that time. Met Jack Hinson. Jack's like, hey, listen, I'm totally neutral in this. I don't really care who wins or loses. It's no skin off my back. <laughs> As Ulysses Grant is looking at the slaves over there. He's like, yeah, yeah, ignore this, guys. But why don't you stay at my house? So they actually became not necessarily friends, but acquaintances. And you, General Grant stayed at Jack Henson's house. So the other people in town were getting a little irritated that Henson wasn't taking the side of the South. But he's like, I'm not going to do it. Two of his sons, one joined a southern army, and the other one joined like a renegade, uh, like a militia unit. Like, well, they were all kind of militia units, but one of them joined this other group. But they, so they went, they left though. They were gone. But he still had other boys. He had his wife. He had his property, including again the slaves. So again, I have to keep hammering that home because that's why they won't make a movie about this guy, regardless of how badass he is. And at the end of the day, he was a slave owner. So he was like, I'm going to stay out of it. Now, in this in this area, they started having these things called bushwhackers, which I always thought was an Australian term. Apparently, it was a term that comes from the Civil War because these people would jump out of bushes and whack you. It was basically a guerrilla army in Tennessee that was just shooting at Union troops. And so the Union officer, like the commanding dude down there, said, okay, zero tolerance to bushwhackers. We're going to kill them on sight. One day, two of Jack's sons are out hunting on their property. We're like hunting rabbits with their rifles. And they stumbled across some Union troops. The Union troops shot them dead right there. Dragged their bodies into town. They knew who the kids were. Dragged their bodies into town to show everyone, this is what happens to bushwhackers. Chopped their heads off. And then put them on the spiked fence at Jack Henson's property. And the officer was going to arrest the whole family at that point for knowing bushwhackers. And someone said, General Grant knows this guy. Like, General Grant has stayed at this house. You probably don't want to arrest him. 
Now, he, he should have known that before he shot the boys, but he's like, okay, I'm not going to arrest them. But you watch out, Jack, because we got your sons. We'll keep an eye on you. Now, Jack Henson does what I think any man would do in a situation like this. Maybe not any man, but he said goodbye to his family. He's like, okay, I got to take care of some stuff now. He then frees his slaves, so they can put that in the movie. They can just start the movie off with him going, goodbye, goodbye, guys who were totally voluntary workers here, and they're like, bye, and then forget all the slave stuff. So after he says goodbye to his family and his former slaves, very important, former slaves, he goes to a weaponsmith and says, I can see him like dropping down this piece of paper and be like, can you, can you build this? And the weaponsmith like puts on his little glasses and is like, what are you hunting with this? And Jack goes, I'm hunting for justice. He has constructed a 50 caliber rifle that is a 41 inch long barrel that's hexagonal because he felt that was more accurate than the smooth bore barrels that were popular at the time. 50 caliber rifle. And he's just walking around. Well, not like walking around in broad daylight with a giant rifle, but he's hunting the officer, the man responsible for killing his sons. Guy's eating soup. Mmm, this is some good old-timey soup. What's in it? And they're like, beans, what else is in old-timey soup? He's like, mmm. Bullet right through the brain. (laughs) Falls all over. Then, he's like, okay. And at that time, people are like, well, that's kind of (laughs) weird. Like, okay, you know, we're at war. You know, guy gets his brains blown out. This kind of happens. But then a short time later, he finds the guy who was responsible for... The the commanding officer who actually put the heads on the pikes and threatened the families. The first one was just the guy who ordered the killing of his sons on the spot. He finds the guy in charge. That guy will say, I don't know, flying a kite. He's like, man, this sure is fun taking a break from the war. I'm just flying this kite. I'm looking straight up and not anywhere around me. My situational awareness is nil. 50 caliber bullet. Through the chest, just blows him to pieces. <laughs> kite goes flying off into the distance. Little known fact, that kite just got lost. There's no fact to that. So anyways, the at this point, now the Union soldiers are like, okay, the first one we thought maybe was just this random shooting, but now that two people have been killed by the same gun, I guess they don't have CSI back then. They don't know it's the same gun, but they go, now that two people have been killed in relation to Jack Henson's sons being killed, and he sent all of his slaves away, and they're like, that was that was good. And he sent his family away. It has to be Jack. It has to be Jack Henson. But at this point, it honestly seems like there was a bit of a lull. Now, I'll also say, there's not a ton of information about what happens between now and later. This is the last event we really know a lot about. But it's I, I, it comes across like he would have stopped because he got vengeance against those two guys. But the Union troops, in retaliation for those murders... Burned down his property. Burned down his house. He's like, oh no, my slave quarters. He's like, uh, I mean, my employee barracks. The whole field, the whole house, everything is destroyed. And Jack Henson is like, now they've gone too far. He becomes a one-man killing machine. He's basically, at this point, for the next few years, running through the wilderness of Tennessee blowing the brains out of any union officer he meets it, he was shooting top staff he wasn't shooting privates he wasn't shooting like low level cooks and stuff like that he wanted every bullet to count he wanted every bullet to wear down the union war machine and this is from a guy who was 100 percent neutral up until the point that the union went after him now because the union won the war there's not a lot of folk tales about this guy what we these are basically the few facts that we know. They sent four regiments of troops out into the wilderness looking for him. Couldn't find him. He was a straight up ghost. He died of old age. We know that for a fact. And when he he went he went on the run after the Civil War. He was a wanted man. And the it's always been one of those things that they don't have an accurate kill count for this guy. His rifle had thirty six notches on it. And because he he would talk to his family about it, like he he ended up reconnecting with his family later on. Two of his sons, two of his other sons, died of other things during the war. But he got away. He told his family about the stuff, and he would notch his rifle if he shot someone and was able to confirm the kill, basically to see the body or to like kick it was kind of the thing. Like you'd shoot a person, you'd have to confirm the kill. 
if he just shot someone and they ran away, he wouldn't notch it. So his official count by his standards was 36 kills with this 50 caliber rifle during the Civil War. Historians believe that the kill count was as high as 100 kills. 100 officers that he shot that then were rushed away for medical treatment and died. And he would never know about that. And the historians think of that for a couple of reasons. But one of them is having four regiments of troops looking for this guy. That's a huge amount of troops to have searching for one guy. So they think he was doing massive damage to the Union war machine down there. Generally, officers don't get killed. Generally, officers aren't targeted. Even though that's your best play, if you see an officer and 20 men, your best play is to kill the officer. Another officer on the other side doesn't necessarily want to order that because it's kind of like this rule of war. But that's what he was aiming for. He was aiming for the top brass. Blow, smearing all, you know, 20 years of training and experience. He just wanted to smear it all over the dirt. He just wanted to blow their heads off. And, and stifle that march across his state. And again, I don't think even when he was walking around blowing, blowing people up, that he really cared about the Civil War. He just wanted revenge. And he got it. He died an old man in bed with his trusty rifle with 36 notches on it, which again, the accounts probably triple that. But I, it's funny because as I'm reading the story, I was like, in any other circumstance, I think this could be a really dope action film. And it basically was The Patriot. It basically was that Mel Gibson movie where he's running around with tomahawks attacking British people. This guy, though, he's real, but, you know, the slaves. I could see the movie trailer where they're like, Coming this June, one man pushed to the brink. Let my sons alone. Why you... No! In my version, he sees the sons get killed, and then they're like, Take these heads and shove it, southern trash. And he's like, No! And then you can do like a quick cut of the heads going uh, uh, on the pikes. And they just show Jack Henson like screaming in the rain. He's like, vengeance. And then they do like a quick montage of him building the gun. In my version, he builds the gun himself and he's testing it. And in this version, no slaves. There's no slaves. Like, well, I mean, it's a civil war, so there are slaves, but he doesn't own any of them. Or better yet, they show him sitting on his plantation and they're like, You know, if the South loses, slavery loses. And he turns and he goes, slavery should lose. And then you have action music starting up. And you can have him running around, just blowing up Union soldiers. And they're like, oh, we thought we were the good guys, but I guess not getting killed. And he's running around with his rifle. And then you could have an evil Union general. Never mind. This movie's not going to work at all. Sorry, I was trying, I was trying, but once I had to keep putting up the Union as the bad guys, Abraham Lincoln's like a mustache twirling villain, he's like, whoa, and then it's like an Inglorious Bastards thing where Jack Henson is the one who kills Abraham Lincoln, that's the 36th notch, we find out Abraham Lincoln underneath his top hat has the, has the severed heads of Jack Henson's sons, that's why he wears that giant top hat, never mind, the movie will never be made, but I do think it's an interesting story, again, a man pushed too far, A man pushed too far. If his sons weren't killed, if they didn't, basically he traded two lives for a hundred lives. And he would never take that trade. The union was stupid for doing it. But yeah, push a man too far. Who knows how to snipe people? You know, that's kind of what happens. So I hope you learned your lesson, the army of the north. Okay, let's go ahead. (laughs) Let's go ahead and move on to our next story. Because that one's getting really... I'm getting in a lot of trouble with that one. So the next story is a really interesting one. Now, I said in the beginning that it's known as the American Dyatlov Pass. Now, that phrase may not mean something to a lot of you. Dyatlov Pass is a very, very intriguing mystery that came out of uh, Russia. Back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, I believe. It's a case, and I'm going to say this now that I don't even know the date, but it was a case that I've looked a lot into. It's very, very fascinating. A group of campers, hikers, go up into this forbidden area known as the Outlaw Pass. Not forbidden by the military, but it's just a cursed, known as a cursed area by the locals. And they all die in super weird ways one night. Now, there are scientists and psychologists who can go, we think this is what happened. It was an avalanche, and then people had mental breakdowns and stuff like that, but there's a lot of just weird things. Like, one guy cut his way out of the tent from the inside. 
And people poured out into the darkness, and they all kind of died. One guy was missing his tongue. It's just this really creepy thing. And there's been all sorts of stuff, whether it's like UFO. I might do an episode on it. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about it because it's fairly well known. But it's been connected to everything from UFOs to demonic forces to an avalanche to some sort of Russian weapon that was being tested. The one we're going to talk about today, though, isn't as well known. And it has been nicknamed the American Dyatlov Pass because it's just so mysterious. So we're going to California, my home state. The year is 1978. And we have five men, five special needs men, on their way to a basketball tournament. Now, they weren't the level of special needs where they like needed adult supervision all the time. These five men, this basketball team, was driving around. Don't you need six people for a basketball team? Or am I getting that confused with that Marlon Wayans movie? I guess the sixth man was the ghost in that movie, so maybe you only need five people for a basketball team. But anyways, these five guys were on their way to compete in a Special Olympics event, which is cool. I have friends who do Special Olympics. Um, But I thought this was an interesting detail. These five men, they're adults. They're driving around on their own. These five men are on their way to a Special Olympics basketball tournament where if they won, they would win a trip to Disneyland. Just give them the trip. Just give them the trip. Like, when I read that, I was like, really? Like, you're going to make a bunch of special needs people play super aggressive basketball because the winning team goes to Disneyland and the losing team does nothing. Like, that's pretty, that's a lot of stress to put on, that's a lot of stress to put on anybody. But then, you know, you have special needs, like, just just send them to Disneyland, dude. When I read that, I'm like, that's quite heartless. To basically dangle that in front of somebody, being like, it's not super aggressive basketball. They're, it's the Special Olympics. It's not, shouldn't be so competitive that the losers actually lose. Like, I'm not saying everyone needs a trophy, but it's Disneyland. And I then, the rest of the time I was reading the article, I kept imagining this super aggressive coach, like an old school 1970s basketball coach, throwing chairs across the across the gym be like get your head in the goddamn game you want to go to disneyland well get the fuck out there and play and people are like what the fuck is this is a special olympics i want to see that's the movie i want to see the civil war movie would be cool but i would love to see a movie about a super aggressive basketball coach who has to coach the special olympics and the joke isn't that I just gotta say this, the joke isn't that like, ha ha, look at those guys playing the Special Olympics. The joke is this guy is taking this way too seriously. I just can't, and the rest of the time I'm, I'm reading this article, I'm thinking, this coach is like, hey, come here, come here, get, 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 give me the ball, give me the ball. What's your fucking problem? You want to go to Disneyland? You like Minnie Mouse? You like Minnie Mouse? Yeah, yeah, I like Minnie Mouse. See that guy over there? Do you see him? He's going to be balls deep in Minnie Mouse if you don't make this goddamn shot. Go back in there. That's the movie I want to see. That's the movie I want to see. So, I have to admit, I was quite distracted the rest of the time I was researching this, because I kept imagining this crazy basketball coach harassing them. However, we will move on as best as we can. These five dudes, (laughs) they don't go to Disneyland, spoiler alert. That is not what happens in this story. They are driving through California. They're up in Yuba County. They stop at a convenience store around 10 p.m. where they're sighted, buying snacks and stuff like that. And then... For the most part, they're never seen again. Because 70 miles away from the convenience store, their car is found on a forest road in Plumas National Forest. Completely abandoned. Deep, deep snow surrounding everything. They were driving up over the mountains. Their car got stuck in the snow off the main road on a forest road in super deep snow. No sign of the people. What happened was when they didn't get to where they were supposed to go, obviously their loved ones were like, hey, these kids, the well, they're not kids, but these adults, their special needs, they would have been here. We think something might have happened to them. There was no way they would miss that basketball game at all. So the cops begin looking, kind of looking in the area. They end up finding the car. This was a little condescending. This This was a quote from a police officer at the scene, a little condescending. They find the car. This is the actual quote. The car was littered with candy wrappers, basketball programs, milk cartons, and other material indicating a good time. Do you think he would have said that if it was five, like, pro college players? That would raise so many suspicions. If they found a car 
that was being driven by college level basketball players. And it's in the middle of nowhere. And they find this. And these are like high level basketball players. One of them's about to get drafted in the NPA. They, they find the car and it's full of Candy Wrappers basketball programs, milk cartons. They would not say, man, it looks like they had a good time. I think that's a little condescending. I think it's because of their special needs that they're like, oh, isn't that cute? They're drinking milk. That would raise suspicions with any other group. So I was like, that's a little condescending. That, that cop's kind of a dick to these dudes. But that was all they had. They had these milk cartons, and curiously enough, each milk carton had the face of the missing person on their own milk carton. No, that didn't happen. But anyways, that would have been cool, and creepy, and that would be a totally different episode. But these guys go missing, and they're thinking, what happened? We have no idea. But one guy might hold the key. His name is Joseph Shones. He was farther up the mountain from where they found the car full of milk cartons, but... He's up there that same night, and his car gets stuck in the snow. And he's like in his 50s, and he's like, oh crap, I gotta dig my car out. Pulls out his little shovel, starts digging the snow away, has a heart attack. And he's like, oh, oh, oh. He crawls into the car, and there's no cell phones. It's 1978. He's laying there in his car, and he's like, what am I gonna do? Like, this sucks. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm having this heart attack. He's laying in his car. It's freezing cold. He's having a heart attack, and he sees five people walk by his car. And he's like, God, wait, wait, come help me. I'm having a heart attack. Uh, uh." And they just walk on by, totally ignore him. And he's like, oh, and you got to think, he was probably thinking like, what are the chances of me having a heart attack in the middle of nowhere? I need help. Five people walk by. I'm saved. And then they just keep on walking. And he's like, a short time later, a pickup truck drives by and he sees it. And he's like, God, help me. I'm having a heart attack. I'm so lucky. Another someone else is out here to save me. Car just drives by. And eventually, the next morning, I thought this was so funny, the next morning, he's just like, well, no one's going to help me. And he walked down the mountain after having a heart attack. At this point, people are already looking for these guys because they were way, way overdue and because they were special needs. So he didn't know any of this. He came, went down, went to the hospital, said, hey, I had a heart attack. I walked down a mountain. A bunch of weird stuff happened. But here I am. He ends up getting treated. And like a day or two later, he hears the news that there's five young special needs men missing. So then he goes to the cops and he's like, this is what I saw. The problem is his story has changed quite a lot. And I don't know if it's him changing it or the articles changing it. He said that the five guys walked by his car and then the pickup truck. I've also heard variations that that all happened at the same time that a pickup truck pulled up, five guys jumped in the back and it drove away. And then I heard variations that the five guys walked by, a man, a woman, and a baby walked by. They all got into a red pickup truck and drove off. And it's so funny because the articles are like, ooh, isn't that mysterious? And his quote generally is, to be honest, I might have hallucinated it. Like, to be honest, I was having a heart attack. He goes, I think I saw something. He's mostly for sure on seeing the five guys walk by. He goes, but for all I know, there was no pickup truck. There was no nobody else. The only reason I know there's five guys because five guys are missing in the same general area. But the red pickup truck and all that stuff, even he's like, I don't know, dude. I was in total pain. I was freezing to death. I thought I was going to die. I might have just hallucinated that second part. Sorry, police. Police looked all over these mountains for these guys. And they're thinking they have to be dead at this point. But they're flying helicopters around. Massive search party for these dudes. Nothing. And Blizzard rolled in and they're like, okay, we got to suspend. We got to suspend the search effort. It's just what are we going to do? And the families are like, you could do more. I don't think the cop just said, what are you going to do? And just walks off from the press conference. And the reporters are like, yeah, what are you going to do? And the families are like, woohoo. But anyways, that was all they could do. Like many of these stories, it's not the police who end up cracking it. It's other people just out in the wilderness having fun. This is where it starts to get weird. People disappearing in the snow, people acting irrationally in the snow, it happens. So a couple months later, these dudes are like dirt biking up there or... RV in or what not RV and ATV in or something up in the woods and they find an abandoned like trailer like a abandoned state property trailer like a ranger's trailer or something like that and there was a window smashed in it and they said hey let's go check that out you know I think they were probably getting ready to rob it but anyways they said let's go see what's in there and not steal anything wink wink and they open the door and the first thing they see is a body underneath a blanket And they immediately fill their pockets full of stuff and then call the police and say, hey, uh, we found something up here. Don't look in our pockets. So the police come up there 
And that is when they identify the body of one of the young men. And the official report was that he died of a mixture of starvation and hypothermia. Now, not at the same time. He wasn't like, I'm so hungry and so cold. Well, he might have said that at some point, but he was very, very emaciated, but and he froze to death. His foot was totally gross. He had gotten frostbite, and it was went untreated, and he got gangrene, so it was all smelly and disgusting. The cops are like, ugh. Hey, let me steal something to plug up my nose. And they later find another body two miles from the trailer. And they think that that was one of the friends who was with him in the trailer. They had found the trailer at some point. And when the one guy died, the second one got scared and ran off. Could also just been the gross smell of the gangrene foot. But anyways, the other dude ran off at some point, died two miles away. Two of the other dudes were found 11 miles from... So, I guess I should have said this. The trailer was 19 miles from the car in, like, waist-deep snow in the forest. So it's quite a journey they find this trailer. It's kind of weird the search party didn't pick it up on it. But, you know, mountains and ravines and trees and all this stuff. Anyways, the two dudes were in the trailer. One of them was found two miles from the trailer. The trailer was 19 miles away from the car. 11 miles from the car, they found the bodies of two dudes. Two of the special, not just two other random guys. They're like, hey, we weren't even looking for these dudes. The working theory was this. They all set off from the car. And one of them succumbed to hypothermia relatively quickly. And one of them said, I'm not going to leave him behind. And they both died together 11 miles from the car. The party then continued another seven miles through deep, deep snow in the middle of the night. Found the trailer. They broke the window to get in, went into the trailer, and then that happened. The fifth guy, they've never, ever found him, ever. Never found any remains. He's just gone. They have no idea what happened to the fifth guy. And you're thinking, Jason, that's not so mysterious. Like, why? They're in a trailer and a guy gets gangrene and one, one, one person doesn't want to leave their buddy behind. That's not mysterious. This is what's weird about this. They won. They were walking up the mountain. Generally, if you're driving up a mountain and your car breaks down, your best bet is to walk back down the mountain. And you may go, well, back down the mountain's 20 miles, but up the mountain could be only 10 miles, but you have no idea what's up there. You know what's down the mountain. Plus, you can just, you know, make sleds and go, wee, go all the way down, right? 20 miles is a long way to sled, but it would be an easier thing. So the first question is, why did they go up the mountain? The second, well, and another question was, people wondered, why did they get on the forest road in the first place? They got off the main road. The dude who had a heart attack was on the main road. They were on a forest road, and there's been suggestions of why did they do that? Were they going to visit someone in the area and trying to take a shortcut? But, you know, the mom of the guy who owned the car was like, he's super, super, well, he was super, super sensitive about his car. He would never take it anywhere where he thought it could get damaged. He would want to stay on a main road. People thought maybe they were being pursued, and that's why they were kept having to move forward. They pulled off on the side of the road to avoid someone, and then they had to keep moving up the mountain to avoid something from following them. And you're thinking, well, Jason, maybe they're just not survivalists. Maybe they think, if I get to... If I get to the top of the mountain, that's where I... Maybe they just weren't thinking. This is, I thought, the weirdest thing about this story. And this is what makes it super eerie. You have the five people set off from the car and heading up the mountain. And we'll accept that one of them is like, I can't go any further. I'm totally cold. And he's like, I need to go to sleep. And the other buddy says, I'll stay with him. And they die. But the other three keep going. That trailer that they found, and they smash the window and get inside... When they found the body of the guy with the gangrene foot, from what they can tell, from facial hair, he was there for two months. He was alive in that trailer for two months. The trailer was, like I said, like a ranger trailer. It had food, and they had, according to these articles, they had enough food for five people for one year. It was basically like a supply trailer. They had food, clothing, books, and they read. I was like, books, who cares? They're not going to sit and read. But I was reading an article and they explained those are perfect for setting fires. But they also had fuel. And I believe they had like a little furnace. But even if they didn't, they had books and matches. So they could have lit their own fires if they needed to. Only a few cans of food were opened. Nothing was burned. The matches weren't lit. None of the books were burned. None of the fuel was used. The The window that they break, broke open wasn't even covered up to keep out the cold. And he starved. While surrounded with 
years worth of for if there was only two people in the trailer at this point let's say the other guy just went missing but even if there was three there was still enough food for three people for like a year and a half two years there's only a couple cans of food opened one guy is starved and dead one guy is dead from hypothermia and the other guy's missing that's what makes the story so weird because again you could see if they had broken in that night they're not going to be like mmm cup of noodles like but after two months, you should be eating some food. Like, after the first couple days, you could be like, oh my god, it's so cold, why don't we patch up that window? They weren't so special needs that they wouldn't know how to do that. So it's such a bizarre story, and that's why the families have, have thought that there was foul play involved. When the police started investigating it, they immediately suspected foul play. And I think now they're kind of like, oh, you know, stuff happens in the woods. But the families to this day are like, no, they were being chased by something, they were being pursued by somebody. The idea of the red pickup truck and the people and them hopping into the back of the pickup truck, that would explain how they got 19 miles away. It wouldn't explain how the bodies were found in various locations, but the creepy scenario that's been put out there was that they were kidnapped, taken to this little trailer in the middle of nowhere, and basically killed by exposure. So it wasn't these guys sitting in this trailer all by themselves And they're like, dang it, no milk, but there's all this other food that someone took them there and was basically refusing to feed them or kicking them out. It's it's super bizarre. It's really, really weird. It would be an interesting way to be a serial killer is to kill people by completely normal methods. But who knows? The only fact that we know is that these five guys are dead. What killed them? How they died? We kind of know how they died, but like what killed them? What drove them farther up the mountain? Why were they there in the first place? All these questions are completely unanswered. But the biggest mystery is how do you starve to death when you're surrounded by at least a year's worth of food? And he got into some of it, so it's not like he didn't know how to open the food. Why only open some of it? Why'd the other guy leave the trailer? Where's the fifth man? Bizarre story. I think it deserves to be called America's The Outlaw Pass. And it definitely deserves more exposure. But it kind of sucks because that's it. Those are all the answers we have. Unless... Someone comes forward and says, oh, no, I saw the red pickup truck that night, or I was the driver of the red pickup truck, and this is what happened. Really, all we have to go on is the eyewitness testimony of a man in the throes of a heart attack, and then five sets of footprints into the snow, four bodies, and a trailer full of mysteries. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O'Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Peace.